You know, when you sign up for a career as a dancer, you pretty much uh, know that you're going to be on a stage with a lot of lights, more often than not wearing a ridiculous costume and jumping around for people who paid to be there. And then when someone asks you to put on a sensible outfit and walk out onto a stage and talk, suddenly your whole world is shattered. And um, <laughs> yeah, there's nothing intimidating about this at all. I'm a little bit freaked out. Um, so because I have access to this feeling that feels so potent right now, I'd like to bring you all here at the same place. I want you to all feel anxious and scared and nervous. And we're going to do that for a reason. So I'd like you to think about that time in your life, a day, maybe last week, last month, when you're at the gym, the library, on campus, and somebody walks up to you, and they're bright-eyed, and they extend their hand forward, or they kiss you or hug you or something strange out of the ordinary. They call you by name, and you have no idea who they are. And it's a little bit torturous because now you're called upon to be right. You have to be accurate. You have to know who that person is, and you can't let them know that you have no idea where they came from, and you don't want to reveal your embarrassment. It starts here, and you're like, oh, God, <laughs> who are you? And then it moves up a little bit more, and then it seizes this front part of your brain, and it feels like everything is squished right here. And you're engaging in a conversation, but the whole time in the back of your mind, like, who is this? Who is this? <laughs> yeah, that was a great dinner party. Who is this? And then the moment has passed, and a few minutes later, maybe it dawns on you, but then you breathe that sigh of relief. But all the while, a meaningful exchange has happened, and you weren't there. You were back here, and you were living in a place that was otherwise not in the moment. I think a lot of times we have that tip of the tongue feeling, but it's easily suppressed because all the answers to many questions are right in our pockets. We have that phone. So if you need a song title, lyric title, or lyrics, or a, a quote, you can access it immediately. But in the presence of somebody else, there are no answers. And there's a really ten a cool tension between two bodies exchanging something, whether it's in a conversation or, in my world, in a dance performance. And I happen to teach one of the most mysterious of all art forms, modern dance. No one gets it. Um, <laughs> You know, you perform for a lot of people who are your friends, and they come, and they pat you on the back, and that was great, and they're like, I don't know what that was, and it was really nice. <laughs> and then you hope that they might give you a little bit of money to keep doing the weird thing that you do. Um, and I have the pleasure of being able to teach it here at Emory University with a lot of bright minds, and I teach dance majors and minors, as well as brand new dancers, people who've never experienced all the things that their limbs can do. They don't really know that they can bend at the waist, and when they come into a classroom and they find out that they can break, uh, bend over without breaking a hip, it's a glorious day. <laughs> and um, like all those art appreciation classes, we send them out into dance concerts. We make them go buy a ticket at the box office and sit in a theater and watch something they most likely had never seen before. And um, I ask them to write a paper about it. So you can imagine what I get in response. And more often than not, the first few lines of the paper indicate something like this. As the lights of the theater went down, I began to get more and more nervous. I was scared, worried about what I was going to see. And I thought, well, this is an environment where I get a lot of pleasure. I'm so excited about these things. Did they think we were going to drop rattlesnakes on them and force them to watch something bizarre? Would people like, cluck like chickens? I don't know. And in the world of modern dance, it could go that way. But more often than not, <laughs> it usually doesn't. So I read further into the paper, and I realize, like, our poor students, they're so afraid of those three words, I don't know. They didn't get it. They don't understand it. They're in a world where a language is being spoken, and they aren't speaking the same language. So immediately, they go to that place that I described. They are here. Like, what is she doing? Why are they rolling to the floor? Did he really slap her? And <laughs> they're not going here which is where I think so much of our artistic exchanges can live, whether you're going to the symphony, where you're going to the, the theater, or some performance arty thing. I believe it really starts here first, and then it can go here well after the flat fact. There's going to be a revelation, and if you allow that thing to come in, it'll feel really great. So we're going to experiment a little bit. I have two amazing dancers, and they are a part of a dance company that I direct. They're over here. They're going to do a very short snippet of a work I premiered a month ago. Now, you have the pleasure of not having to endure 50 minutes of it, more like 45 seconds. And admittedly, maybe not enough time to sink into some groovy meta, meta place where you're feeling stuff, but just 
Yeah, watch. All right. All right. So, um, not a whole lot of context to go from. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. I pay them the big bucks. <laughs> um, there's no context. You had no title, and I don't know really what was going on through your mind. Maybe like, ooh, that was kind of matrixy, or ooh, do they are they lovers? Uh, do they hate each other? They're rolling on the floor. Does he not have money for costumes? Where was the music? Um, <laughs> Gee, Emory ought to give them a raise so they can wear something decent. <laughs> Any number of things could have gone through your mind, and I really think that when we experience something artistic, it is probably more akin to the way we live as infants. We don't have answers. We kind of look at something for the first time. And imagine, well, you can't remember, probably. If you can, you're amazing. But laying in the crib and looking at that thing that would spin around with all the animals on, it has that obnoxious song that plays over and over and over. And then the baby can look at this thing and be fascinated for so long. And the baby can be fascinated by the expressions on the parents' faces. It can be fascinated by that little toy that will go to over and over and over. Because the baby has no uh, need to overcome boredom. There are no emails for the baby to answer. But as we age, our tolerance for boredom gets much, more, much lower. Frederick Nietzsche said our lives are too short to deal with boredom. So details start to go away and we're gonna look for an immediate satisfaction and the answer must be there right away or I can't invest, I got so much to do. So I even notice in live performances so many students immediately go right to their phone during the gaps between the dances. So there's another missed opportunity for something to come in. And so by doing this, we ruin, our, we make our resources a little bit more numb. The resources that helped us build pyramids, the resources that helped us navigate over oceans, the things that helped us slay a wildebeest so we had food, the things that helped me as a transplanted Armenian-Iranian child in rural Pennsylvania navigate a cornfield to get from high school to my parents' house. And so I think at a very early age, I kind of learned to love details a lot. My father was in the US Army, my mother is Armenian, and when we lived in Iran, I had to study behavior a lot. We, lived right, uh, we left right before the revolution, and we moved to Pennsylvania, and there I stood out as well. So I studied behavior incessantly, and I wanted to know why people did the things they did. I looked at the way they interacted with one another, and I became fascinated in what was not spoken. And maybe that is a thing that led to a career in dance, I don't know. But I learned to imitate and then take these imitations and move them into something else, displace them, and at the risk of feeling vulnerable, take them out of my body and put them in someone else's to lend a little bit more mystery, more ambiguity to what it is I was asking the audience to watch. So with that, I'd like you to watch the same duet, and I'll give you a little bit more context with aural information now. So same 45 seconds, and um, yeah, you can click that. Uh, 
That genre of music is pretty familiar. I mean, we encounter it a lot. And you add some music to something and immediately our point of entry is a little bit more clear. Music is around us all the time. That is not around you all the time. Imagine encountering that at the produce aisle. You don't see it. <laughs> so, um, so you add music, our brains are trained to find relationships really quickly, which is why we can drive on a highway effortlessly. The cars that are merging, we can assess and put them and categorize them appropriately and not have to worry about it. We add sound to movement and suddenly we can make a connection. Ask any person who devises a uh, soundtrack for a movie score. They know how to get to you here and then eventually here. And so with music and dance together, it's a really exciting place to be. And sometimes it does a lot of the work for you. And this is the difference to me between art and entertainment. So this could be entertaining. Maybe it's affirming something you had seen before. They're dancing to the music. The lyrics might inform you of something. So as an audience member, you get to sit back and let the thing come to you. Again, not enjoying the chance to be lost inside of what was happening. So if you could think about the difference between art and entertainment, art is going to raise questions. Art is going to throw you someplace where you haven't been before. And it's that you're, at that moment, you can decide, I'm going to jump in or I'm going to resist. And so what I'd like to do, another little experiment, I know audience participation is scary, but this is simple. So I'd like you to identify your right hand, and that's the one on this side of the studio. Um, uh, I have to do this for our dancers all the time. And stretch it up in the air as much as you can. Just reach, it's not, not even like a skill set. Reach it until you feel like the shoulder coming out of the torso. And let's let go of that idea and mash the brake pedal with your left foot. It would be scary if you did that, but if your left foot is mashing down on a brake pedal, push down pretty hard until you can't anymore. And now go back to the hand again and then mash down the break again. So we know the beginning and the end. The beautiful part about art is all the stuff that's in the middle. So we're gonna go back up here again and I'd like to ask you to now pay attention to every detail that occurs through your body to get down to there. It might take a while, but go. And just start to pay attention to all the movements that are happening through the torso, through the arms, through the belly, maybe through the quadriceps, down to the foot. Invest in the little details. And we're gonna do that one more time. And enjoy the idea that the questions that are being asked are being answered simultaneously and they're all dissolving at the same time. So we go deeper inside, we find something that feels more rich, maybe a way of moving that you haven't done before, and you get to that dynamic, full force of the foot on the floor. That's pretty exciting to me. And that, I'm sure there are plenty of anatomists here, we are at Emory, they can tell you what's pronating, supinating, abducting, adducting, all those things. But if I were to ask you to write down what happened, you probably wouldn't be able to define everything. And man, that's really exciting. Because then when someone says, well, what did it feel like or what did it look like, you'd be like, it's like this. <laughs> and now you're speaking in language that's primal and really, really authentic and I think far more beautiful. One more version of the, the duet with different aural landscape for you. One more time. So, <clears throat> I intentionally tried to find music that had more space between the notes, which would allow you to have more space between the movements and then define things a little bit more clearly. Of course, you're dealing with familiarity. You've seen it now three times. You could probably predict, oh, that's the head part or the push the knee part. And um, there, there's some familiarity there. But then our point of entry is not muddied or sullied by something else that's arbitrary. And we open up the playing field to enter into something 
that can be a uniquely personal experience. A lot of times people ask me, what is your work about? And that word about scares, the, uh, scares me to death. Because the moment I say it's about something, there are expectations. And the moment I can write it out in words, I feel like, uh, it's so much easier to do that and apply for a grant and say, hey, pay me for this document I just sent you, rather than uh, coordinating 12 dancers' schedules, finding a studio, renting a theater, finding music, getting costumes or no costumes. It's much more cost effective to write about it than show it. But I feel like when you get to show something and you have this sort of moment, it feels a lot better than reading about it because then the intellect goes away and something that's deeper inside can resonate with something that's profound. And then again, when you leave the theater, it was so, uh, or it was like, <laughs> I don't want to talk about it right now. And you don't know why. And that is really, <laughs> or they could not want to talk about it for other reasons too, like, oh, I don't want to talk about it. And so that's a really exciting place to be. There's a lot of space. The space between, um, movement and stillness is dynamic and exciting. The space between asking someone to the prom and waiting for the answer is really exciting. The, the silence in music, where the last note that you hear has got to absorb the energy of the first part of the symphony, transform it in a matter of like a nanosecond, and move it to the next idea is thrilling. So the antimatter is so rich, and the antimatter cannot be navigated. And the antimatter that exists between you and the performers is a very vibrant place to be. And so when you're at a theater and those people tell you to sit back and relax and enjoy the show, I think that's probably the last thing you'd ever want to do. Because then it's coming to you. It already comes to you through your iPod and your YouTube things. We can bring it and push it away. But when it's live, it's so exciting to be there, up in each other's grills, up in each other's faces, and experience it. And whether you reject it or decide, well, it's not for me, at least you were there. You were in the muddy water. You were in the forest identifying the two trees, the creek and the rock, to navigate in and out. You can enter the space, deal with it, too freaky for me, and I go back out. But you felt something. The teacher I studied with in Israel, Ohad Naharin, is the, uh, the artistic director of a dance company that I happen to admire a lot. And the last time I was there, he had analyzed, uh, he speaks a language that I felt more here that he gave voice to. And that was exciting for me. But one of the most rich bits of advice I'd received from him was that we cannot let ambition be our engine. So the moment we enter into something, having to know the answers immediately and not enjoying being lost and our ambition takes over, we've precluded any sort of human exchange. And this is why I love dance so much. And this is why, like 10, 12 minutes ago, when I was scared to death to be here in front of you, that this space between us felt so much more navigatable, if that's a word. So I say just get, let yourself get lost. Go someplace different. Be scared. Be spooky. And I promise you, the more lost you are, the closer to home you will ever, the closer to home you are. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank